for, for Dan for, for arranging, uh, arranging the, the, the talk itself. He also told me today that this was the inaugural lecture for the, you know, so no pressure at all. Um, so, so what I wanted to do today is I, I want to take a look at how we are doing building and sustaining digital heritage projects at Michigan State University. Um, and the sort of the guiding kind of narrative for this is my research center, which is Matrix, the Center for Digital Humanities and Social Sciences. The thing you have to know about Michigan State University, and the thing that will come up inevitably, is the fact that there is sort of an entanglement of lots of different centers and lots of different departments and lots of different scholars. Um, and, and I'm just sort of looking at you know, what we do through the lens of my own, uh, my own research, uh, research center, which I'll, which I'll talk about sort of the, you know, the why and what we do and that kind of stuff. And then I, I want to sort of bind, so in, in many ways, this is a bit of a, uh, a project fire hose. I'm going to sort of go through a whole sort of variety of projects that, that we do. Um, but then I'm kind of going to bind it up at the end with sort of what drives us, what fuels us, our ethos. Um, that, that, that guides all of these projects and more importantly guides the way in which we do these, uh, do these projects. Uh, the one sort of caveat is because I didn't bring the adapter, we have to switch it over to PDF, so all of the fancy animations that I've got are like gone up and that's something that's just caveat. Alright, um, so, um, right, Michigan State University, so I'm assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology. Um, at there, I teach archaeology, I teach heritage studies, um, I teach digital heritage, I am sort of one of the archaeology uh, faculty, uh, faculty there. Um, MSU is actually important in a lot of ways. The, the institution is important um, in the way in which sort of the special character of the institution and the way in which that special character has very much shaped how we do what we uh, what we uh, do, and I'll talk about that in a um, in a in a second. I am an archaeologist. Here's my street cred. This is me, a lot thinner and with a lot more hair. Uh, this is at Nopta Playa. Um, I I worked in Egypt. Um, I haven't put a trial on the ground for for years and years and years, but I technically am um, an an archaeologist. Um, I also direct the Cultural Heritage Informatics Initiative, which will come up a little bit um, in the discussion. Uh, CHI, it lives in the Department of Anthropology. It's an initiative because you actually can call anything an initiative at MSU, and there's no administrative oversight. <laughs> you can't call things programs without administrative oversight, so I tend to call a lot of things initiatives because it sounds very formal, but in fact, it actually isn't. Um, CHI was founded um, seven years ago now um, as a way to address the issue of students, either um, uh, undergraduates or graduates, going out into the world and being challenged with uniquely digital questions for which they have no training at all. Um, and CHI is essentially a way to address that in a very nimble kind of uh, framework. Um, under the auspices of the Cultural Heritage Informatics Initiative, I teach a digital heritage field school, which is essentially like an archaeological field school, but it is all about digital heritage. Um, I also run a, um, uh, um, a graduate fellowship program, so it's all about sort of capacitating. So again, this is CHI is kind of one of these nodes and kind of this larger ecosystem of stuff at, uh, at Michigan State University. All right, so back to that, uh, that sort of the idea of MSU very much guiding and shaping the work that we do, uh, both at my center, which again I'll talk about in a little bit, as well as more broadly. Um, MSU, Michigan State University, is the largest contiguous campus in the United States. Um, it is uh, about 52 thousand acres all told it's a huge campus the vast majority it's an ag school so the vast majority of that is you know sheep and yamas and goats and cows and stuff like that which is entertaining um, we have the best ice cream at MSU we have our own day it's wonderful um, 
the, the university is a, a pioneering land-grant institution, and if you know anything about the history of universities within the United States, a land-grant institution was something very specific. It, was, it had specific goals. It was applied education. Um, it was um, intended to um, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, provide students with skills that they could go on and apply in sort of the, uh, the, the ag field or the, you know, the natural resources field and, and stuff, like, uh, stuff like that. It is actually the pioneering land-grant institution. It's the first of its uh, kind um, in the United States. Um, and the real underlying narrative of MSU is uh, both, like I said, applied education and laboring in the public good. Right? We're a public institution, and we have a very, very strong ethos of public education, and the work that we do is for the public good. So again, you know, you'll find that really kind of very much uh, work its way into lots of places um, in the university, but it's also very much work its way has is um, in sort of embedded, entwined baked into what the digital heritage work that we look at, uh, we do. You're actually looking at what's called the sacred circle. This is the actual center um, of, of campus. This is the Michigan State University uh, Museum. And this whole area in here is the oldest portion of the museum. The museum was founded in 1855. Um, uh, which by English standards, that's certainly not very old, but by American standards, that's actually fairly old. Um, and you're not actually allowed to build anywhere inside the, uh, the sacred circle. So this is kind of the heart, uh, uh, heart of campus. So on to Matrix, right? So this is the, like I said, this is sort of the narrative, the thread that is weaving its way through this entire talk. Uh, Matrix was founded in 1995. It is the oldest, or one of the oldest, of the sort of the first wave of digital humanities centers uh, within um, North America. Um, our we we are a what's called a research center of excellence at MSU. That puts us on par with an academic department. Um, that's fairly odd in the United States, um, where lots of research centers don't actually have academic administrative standing within the institution. Um, so we're sort of rare in that regard. So we, we exist sort of administratively on par with, a, a, with an academic department. We are not degree granting or course offering in any way, shape, or form. We are a research uh, center. Now, digital humanities centers have a tendency to break down in one or two models, either a service center or a research center. Service centers tend to live um, in libraries, and their goal is primarily to provide service for the university community, whether it's students or whether it is um, uh, faculty. Um, then there's the research centers who are engaged in pure research, research in quotes, because our research uh, and the kind of research that, that we do looks different than what you can find in a sort of a, you know, biology lab or something like that. So, but we are essentially in uh, you know, focus on doing on um, pure uh, uh, digital research. Um, our work falls into, sort of can be characterized in, in sort of one or three ways. We're focused on culture and heritage, material culture, and then <coughs> glam sectors, so galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, again, digital humanities centers have a tendency to break down all, along two poles, either focused on language and literature or focused on heritage and culture. We, and of course, you know, that's, there's lots of overlaps between those two, but we fall on the culture heritage uh, side of things, and that's historical. That's so just we have a, as a center um, have evolved. We are deeply internationally focused and deeply African focused. Um, the vast majority of our projects, but certainly not all of our projects, um, are working with African partners, focusing on African content. And again, that's a little historical because Michigan State University, as an institution, has always been very focused on Africa. We have the leading African Studies Center. We have the leading um, a department or program, a graduate program in African history. It's just sort of the nature of um, sort of historically um, MSU. 
Um, so it's no great surprise that a lot of the work that we do is focused in that direction um, as well. We're particularly interested in preservation and access, and you'll see this in a lot of the projects that we talk about. They are preservation projects, but we take the approach that you cannot have preservation with access. You know, why are you preserving this thing if not to provide access to it? Um, uh, you know, for some sort of public. We're also deeply, deeply committed, and I'll come back to this at the end of the talk as well. Open access, open source, open data, open web, right? All of what we do is um, guided by this idea of openness. Um, we're also particularly interested in publicly engaged digital heritage, and that's my work personally. Um, uh, I'm very interested in publicly engaged digital heritage. And then we do a lot of software development, which is kind of odd for digital humanities centers. We're, we, we're historically very computer science oriented, and again, it's sort of a weird um, uh, um, factor of how we evolved and kind of how we grew up. So this is sort of matrix in a, in a bit of a, nut, a nutshell. We're really fortunate in that we have very, very large facilities. This is actually our programmer bullpen. Uh, we employ, uh, on any given day or any given semester, between 15 and 20 undergraduate programmers, all of our developers are undergraduates and graduate students. Um, and we've become really, really good at sort of managing those and technical managing and managing those projects. This is a programmable pen. Um, we are also really engaged in digitizing endangered cultural heritage. And you're gonna see that in a lot of these projects. And we have this very, this is only one quarter of our digital lab, and you can actually see, right, all these sort of legacy to see um, a media machines that allow us to sort of digitize audio and video things, you know, for this kind of preservation access. This is Mike Green. Uh, Mike is the director of our, our digital lab. Um, we were also the last institution on, or the unit on campus that was allowed to build its own server room. This, this is actually pretty important within universities that are increasingly trying to control to centrally control IT. Um, and we have a full server stack and, and the, the real sort of benefits, a double-edged sword very much so, um, the, the real benefit is that we control our environment entirely. We're actually considered to be a site of digital preservation by the IMLS, which is the Institute for Museum and Library Services. So we are a preservation environment, um, sort of arc, digital archive level preservation environment. Uh, so it's, it's good in that regard, and it really sort of speaks to this preservation work that we do. The other edge of that double-edged sword is we got to deal with this stuff when things go down. Like, for instance, last weekend, the weekend before I came, my building turned off all of the water just as part of regular maintenance. That means the AC went off as well. Um, and we got uh, warnings at 3 o'clock in the morning that all of our servers had shut off because the temperature had raised too high. So we had to rush over and deal with, uh, uh, deal with this stuff. Or my systems administrator had to rush over and deal with this stuff. I didn't. Um, so anyways, double-edged sword in this, in this regard. And this is, our, this is the back of our sysadmin, this is Charles. Right? So we're, again, we're very, very fortunate in that you know, we have this server stack but we also have individuals to, to manage it. Um, all right, so by the numbers. Um, so like I said, we were founded in 1995. Uh, Two center directors, myself and Dean Rayberger. Dean Rayberger is a professor in history. Um, uh, we have very, very strong ties to both his, history and anthropology as departments. That is very much a factor of where the faculty come from, right? I'm, a, I'm faculty in anthropology. Students, faculty, and history. We've got nine full time staff, digital librarians, system administrators, two, uh, two, one head of programming, assistant head of programming, administrators, right? You know, so we have these are full time staff. Uh, between 15 and 20 student devs. We've got four or five student media techs that are, uh, you know, Mike, I showed you that picture of Mike, manages. We've got five graduate students that are working on sort of a variety of grant funded projects that'll float in and out. And then we've got 27 affiliated researchers. So all told, it's actually quite a large group 
um, of both full-time staff um, as well as affiliated um, individuals. We are incredibly grant productive and grant successful, relatively speaking. Um, since 95, we've had 52 grants, totaling around 15 million bucks. That is not a lot compared to, like, for instance, um, our, um, you know, high performance computing or physics people, but in the humanities and social sciences, this is enormous, um, the amount of money. Now, now we are not soft funded, we are soft money supplemented, where we actually have a budget that comes, we live in the College of Social Sciences, um, so a budget that comes from the College of Social Sciences, and then all of our project, and that pays for all of our staff, and then all of our project work is essentially uh, soft money. We do a fair amount of R&D internally, uh, but I spend the vast majority of my life writing grants. I mean, that's just what we do um, in order to um, uh, sort of keep the keep the projects rolling and continue the, continue the projects. All right, so that's a, right, it's a baseline talking about matrix itself. What are the kind of projects that we do? So this is the fire hose portion of this, uh, of this uh, talk. And what I wanna do is I wanna run you through a series of projects, some of which are sort of newly launched, some of which are what we sort of refer to as legacy projects. Like I said, we've been around since 1995. So we have projects that um, have been uh, around for a long time and it's our responsibility to sustain them. Um, some of the projects that I'll sort of mention um, are very much in development and I'm actually going to talk about a couple of projects um, where you guys are going to be the first to hear about them and the first to see some of the, some of the work that, that we're doing. Um, I've provided all the URLs for the ones that are public. I, I don't want to risk trying to demo anything, uh, anything live, uh, but if you want to check the project out, you're, you're perfectly uh, welcome to. So the first one I talk about is the Archive of Malian Photography. I talked about this um, at uh, uh, UCL, the talk I gave at UCL um, earlier this week. Um, but again, I'm going to sort of, I'm going to uh, talk about it again because most of you weren't there. Um, but it's also a really important kind of case study uh, for the way in which we uh, way in which we do things. This is a live project. It actually, just went uh, uh, just went live. Um, okay, so Mali, specifically Bamako, the capital of Mali, was very much the center of photography, both commercial photography and art photography, um, in French West Africa. Um, and there emerged this incredibly thriving scene of photographers that was absolutely unrivaled anywhere um, in uh, the entirety of French West Africa, and quite honestly, um, Africa as, uh, as a whole. Um, this project is focusing on that um, uh, photography scene in Mali, both colonial and post-colonial. And here are some, some uh, images from the archive, like I said, and I always say this is absolutely my favorite image out of the entire archive, the dude with the boombox. Um, and, and we can see it's, it's, it's portraiture, it's reportage, um, it sort of very much sort of runs the, runs the gambit. Um, within sort of the recent maybe 10 years or so, um, these photographs have become very, very desirable, very popular uh, on the European um, sort of art gallery scene. Um, and unfortunately, there have been many, many instances where gallery directors, dealers, have come to the, these photographers or their descendants, the, the owners, because all of these, the, the photographs that, that we're looking at, and I'll talk about some numbers in a little bit, are all familial patrimony, right? They belong to the family. These aren't government. These aren't uh, sort of publicly available kinds of things. 
So what's happened is these dealers or these direct art gallery directors have come to these photographers and said, look, we want to put on a show in Stockholm or Berlin or Paris or wherever, um, which will sort of raise the profile of your father or you, depending on who it was, um, and potentially sort of uh, result in, in more sales and more sorts of kind of an economic argument that is made. This is obviously something of much interest to the, the people who own the, the archives, the, like I said, the, the photographers themselves or their descendants, and they, in, in historically, they've always said yes. There's been a few instances where these dealers have said, all right, give us the negatives, and then they're never heard from again. And they, they start reproducing them, and they start selling them with no money given to the photographers um, them, themselves. So, so there is a, a need to protect the sort of familial patrimony of these photographers. But on the other hand, this material is incredibly important to historians, ethnographers, visual anthropologists, um, art historians. Um, and in fact, this project is uh, the, two co the two PIs, or myself, and Candace Keller, who is a professor in the Department of Art, Art, History, and Design, she is an art historian of generated both in English and in uh, French. Um, and then this digital archive was built of the uh, uh, of these of these um, uh, these photographs. Um, it's important to note that this phase of the project was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. However, a previous exploratory phase was actually funded by the British Library's Endangered Archives uh, program. Um, so lots of public money has gone in to fund, uh, to fund this, uh, fund this uh, work. Now, the real sort of important narrative here in this project is the engagement with the community, right? There's just a picture of some of the individuals who are involved with the, um, with the project itself. Um, some of these are, so Musa here, he is a photography student. He's actually not a student anymore, but at the time he was a student. Um, so we have these, uh, these three guys here, students, that's their professor. Um, he is the son of one of the photographers. He is the son of one of the photographers. He is the son of one of the photographers. So again, it's this very sort of family community oriented thing. And the real, even though, you know, the scope of the project is large and, you know, we digitize lots of things, it's really that community engagement and that equitable partnership that happened during the course of building, uh, building this project. We've actually just launched um, this with maybe about a third of the photographs. The rest of them are probably going to go up um, over, the, uh, over the summer. All right, moving on, Gory Island. Um, so people are familiar with Gory Island? You look what I, yes, no, no, okay. So Gory Island is a tiny, not tiny, about nine kilometer long island um, off of uh, the coast of Dakar. Um, Gory Island was for a very, very long time thought to be the primary sort of hub for the transatlantic slave trade. Um, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was inscribed 78, 79, something uh, like that. And the sort of the rhetoric around the entire island, um, which has these very famous Mesogues de Slave, the slave houses, um, and what is sort of depressingly called the door of no return. It was actually the debarkation point or embarkation point um, where the last place that enslaved individuals would touch the shores of Africa. And it's this, there's all these dramatic pictures of, you know, dark and with this door looking out onto the, the ocean. The narrative has actually since changed, the scholarly narrative has, has changed. Um, and now most historians and historical archaeologists and archaeologists of um, enslavement um, uh, recognize that Gori, while important in the transatlantic slave trade, was not absolutely central to it. That's neither here nor there. It's still particularly um, important. This is what Gori looks like today. There's a limited number of individuals who are allowed to, to live on Gori, um, all of which, or most of which, are actually descendants uh, from local populations and local enslaved populations. Um, there has been 
Um, excavations um, primarily by Ibrahim Chow, who is a professor at UCAD, the University of Dakar. He's a historical archaeologist he's trained in the United States. There's been some, so he's done a lot of excavations. Um, there's been excavations done by archaeologists from Rice and the University of Houston, uh, I believe. The result is this, right? You know, this is a typical physical archaeological repository um, that you find certainly in, in West Africa. Now there isn't a preservation issue here. This stuff is all preserved very, very uh, well, but there is an access issue, right? This is really, really important stuff. It's very important for, uh, for archaeologists and historians and ethnohistorians who work on the transatlantic slave trade. It's completely in accessible. So as part of this project, which is ongoing now, a collaboration between the University of Dakar, um, us and the new Smithsonian um, uh, Museum of African and African American History and Culture, I think that's its official name, um, are building a digital archive of the materials so it's sort of more accessible. Um, we're also doing 3D stuff, right? 3D scanning, photogrammetry um, of really important material culture. All of the 3D scanning is being done by undergraduates and graduate students, archaeologists at the University of Dakar. So there's an important capacity building aspect uh, to this project um, as well. Because in many cases, th this material is, these, these people here are literally the descendants of those individuals. And some of them actually live um, on uh, Gory Island uh, right now. And of course, you know, so 3D stuff, right? You know, it's basic field-based photogrammetry and then 3D printing, right? That we want that pipeline. We're really interested in that pipeline, not only providing sort of access to the material culture and the excavation records um, through a digital archive, but actually that sort of materiality, that tangibility, that physical aspect um, of the material culture so people can print it out, people can engage with this stuff, especially given the importance um, of, this, uh, of this project. So this one, this one is ongoing right now. Um, Mike, the director of our digital lab, uh, lab um, was actually back in Senegal two, three weeks ago, uh, coordinating and, and, and working with the people there. All right, let's move on to slave biographies. So slave biographies is a collaboration uh, between us and the history department in, at, uh, at MSU. Um, the PI is Walter Hawthorne, who's the chair of history, um, who is a historian of the slave trade. Um, so the problem with, there's, there's been a lot of work on uh, sort of digital projects on enslavement um, on both sides of the Atlantic. The, the problem is that the unit of sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, analysis, the unit of interrogation um, is always sort of above the individual, right? The plantation, the ship, right? That's not talking about the individual. Slave biographies was essentially an attempt to expose and explore the lives of the individual enslaved. Um, we've both succeeded and failed in that regard. This is it's an incredibly complicated undertaking, given the fact that within the historical record and certainly within the archaeological record, the vast majority of the enslaved had no identity at all. So how do you seek to expose that when the, you know, sort of the history and the practice of enslavement has done so much violence to them in the first place? But we've tried. All right, so historical documents, this historical record, so multiple sources, so French, Spanish, um, early American, so this all New World stuff. Um, there are about 100,000 records um, in the, the project itself, and that is roughly 100,000 individuals, right? Now, again, that's really, really problematic because it's hard to disambiguate individuals from the historic record, especially enslaved individuals, when there is only, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, man with scar, right? How do we disambiguate that 
from all of the other all of the other records. We're actually kind of working on that problem right uh, right now. Um, each of the records has a hundred pieces of metadata. That's kind of out of control. Uh, the amount of, of metadata, but it speaks to the potential sort of richness of material that can be pulled from the historic uh, record. Primary sources of in estate inventories, probate documents, and sales not involving probate. So again, these are all documents relating to the, the trafficking of the enslaved, uh, which again, as historical documents, is, is kind of problematic. Um, the ultimate goal, and this is sort of on the, didn't quite, um, uh, weren't quite able to sort of accomplish this, is documenting the movement of individuals through space and time and uncovering kin relationships between individuals. Um, again, very, very uh, difficult. In some cases we can do that because there are some records uh, uh, you know, individuals who are well known within the historic, um, the historic record, we can sort of chart them across uh, across time and uh, time and space. Um, so, so the success of slave biographies is is you know first it's there's a lot of data there, uh, so you know people who are interested in sort of the transatlantic slave trade. But it's also what we learned because it has very much informed a new project that we're starting now called Past People of the Atlantic Slave Trade that I'm going to talk about at the end of, uh, of this. All right, moving on to What America Ate. Uh, and again, I, I would suggest that you go to the URL there, What America Ate, because the, I can't show you the full screenshot. Um, so what America ate? So what America ate is this is this is not an African or Africanist uh, project. It's a purely historical project. It's a collaboration with Helen Veit. Helen Veit is a faculty member in the Department of History. She's interested in foodways and the history of food and the history of food within the, the Great Depression. Um, and that's what this the, that's what this project is. It's essentially you know preserving providing access to and exploring foodways within the Great Depression within the United States. And essentially what it is, it's a giant uh, digital archive of community cookbooks, advertising, and American Eats. American Eats was a project by the WPA, Work Projects, Work Projects Administration, uh, which was essentially uh, to document uh, American food ways, and there's all sorts of um, sort of weird, you know, field notes of people going out into communities and recording uh, recording stuff. Um, so you got you've got these American Eat stuff, you've got community cookbooks, and you've got you've got advertising uh, oops, advertising there. Um, so you can it's it is at its core, it's a digital library. Um, that you can sort of explore. At the end of the summer, we are launching a whole series of crowdsourcing tools that will allow people to annotate um, the project for discovery and for um, for search uh, uh, search purposes. And we've got this whole sort of uh, reward point based system where you do a certain amount of annotation or transcription, and you actually get a copy of. That uh, that recipe, and you build those recipes, uh, build them up in your own cookbook, your personal user uh, cookbook. Um, crowdsourcing is a problematic thing um, because uh, it's it's quite honestly hard to get the crowd to actually do things. However, there are certain sort of topical instances that have pre-existing communities the foodie community, where they are more invested in doing some crowdsourcing because they're already predisposed towards this, uh, predisposed towards this uh, content. Uh, so we're going to be launching that in, I think, the end of the summer, or finishing off developing the tools right now. But the sort of basic digital archive is actually uh, accessible, uh, accessible right now. You can just go to learnarcade.org. All right, moving back to Africa and moving back to a decidedly 1995 design aesthetic. Uh, because we've been around for so long, there's some legacy projects that really look like they were made in the, in the 90s. 
Oh, we do. Um, this is the African Online Digital Library. The African Online Digital Library is, so AODL.org, um, had been um, a portal, right, very 90s web speak, um, for all of our African projects, like 27, 28 projects. And it was just a way to kind of jump into uh, those, uh, jump into those projects. Like I said, it was just a, it was just a portal. Um, we're now in the process of actually reconceiving and rebuilding AODL um, as a digital library that is akin to Europeana or Canadiana or DPLA, right? Um, up until now, AODL is just our stuff. We have a lot of African stuff, but it is still just our stuff. Um, there are a lot of these sort of federation digital library platforms that bring together material culture or archives from heritage institutions or projects, but there is none that is exclusively focused on Africa, and that is what we are uh, what we are doing. <coughs> so, um, and again, um, I'm sorry you can't see the the sort of full designs. Um, so this is the new AODL, uh, what, it, what it looks like, uh, exploring collections by dates, by map, by, by topic. Um, we have built out, so this is, you, you actually can't engage with this right now, this is all on our dev servers and we're sort of building it, uh, building it up. We're probably in the next four or five months, we're going to launch sort of a proof of concept so people can actually look at this um, in order to start to build interest in collaborations uh, between lots of other institutions and these people we kind of want to draw into this, uh, this collaboration. So mapping stuff, um, and then again, I'm sorry, you can't see full, this, uh, this full thing, but essentially, you know, it's a digital library, you know, searching across these sort of multiple uh, digital, uh, digital libraries. Um, and again, you know, our ultimate goal long term is to turn this into um, a Europeana or an Africana uh, digital, uh, digital library um, to bring together all these disparate collections. Um, that exist and are maybe accessible, maybe not accessible. All right, another African project. This is um, uh, uh, Overcoming Apartheid. That's sort of what we call it. It's Overcoming Apartheid, that msu.edu. Uh, uh, so during the struggle against apartheid, um, there were lots of independent journalists, photographer, non-state uh, journalists, who are running around documenting the struggle against apartheid. And overcoming apartheid, which again is, uh, is an older sort of legacy uh, project, was an attempt to uh, provide access to that material. It is essentially an oral history of the struggle against apartheid wrapped in explicitly educational materials. So this project was actually funded by the U.S. Department of Education, and as such, it had specific educational goals. So there is, you see here, for educators, so there is classroom material, there are lesson plans, there are ways to engage and bring the discussion about apartheid and South Africa and the struggle against apartheid into U.S. classes. That was the whole point of this. But beyond that, it is essentially an oral history of all of these individuals, many of which who have died. For instance, Ahmed Katrada just died very, very recently. Um, and he played an absolutely pivotal role in the struggle against apartheid, and he has figured very, very prominently um, in this overcoming apartheid project. We've actually talked about redesigning this. This still gets between nine and 10,000 unique hits a month. Um, so for a project that was made in 2001, 2002, I think it was, um, that's fairly significant. Okay, this is ARCS. Uh, this is one of my projects. ARCS is the Archaeological Resource Cataloging System. So for those of you who are archaeologists or know archaeologists, will know that regardless of where archaeologists are working, one of the things that archaeologists generate 
are field notes, right? No matter where you are working, you keep a field journal that is basically your kind of qualitative, you know, personal reflections upon what you did that day and what you found that day and what the weather was and how much of a, an idiot your trench member, you know, partner was being and, you know, little maps and things like that, right? This is, this is primary information that unfortunately very, very ever or rarely gets published, almost always is sort of stuck in a, an archive and it is really important data that can lend to speak to the interpretation um, of the archaeological record. So ARCS is so it's a collaboration between myself and John Fry. John Fry is a classical archaeologist at Michigan State University who works at ISMIA. Um, it is a platform that would allow projects to publish their field journals as well as you know, photographs and note cards and things uh, and things like that. Um, it would allow people to build collections of these materials. You can link from certain things. I'll just show you a, uh, um, a detailed view. Um, you can link from uh, things within the field journal to other field journals. Um, it's got sort of robust metadata for the, the field journal itself both on the project level, season excavation, archival objects, and the subjects of observation. So, you know, this piece of ceramic or something, uh, something like that. Um, it also allows for crowdsourcing. Uh, so this metadata can actually be crowdsourced. There's discussion that could go on around these, these field journals. Um, and this is an installable platform. So the idea is that this isn't a one platform that all archaeologists in the world contribute to. No, this is something that if you have a project, you can install this on your servers and use it for your, um, uh, your particular field journals. And, and any installation of ARCs uh, can support multiple sites. So if you have, you work in a lab, that has um, of field journals and photographs and hand-drawn notes to digitize them, to put them up, to share them, to publish them, to link them, uh, link them together. Um, we are, this is, again, this is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. We are in our last year, um, and this is going to be released as open source software for anyone to use um, and anyone to install. We'll have a version that will sit at arcs.matrix.msu.edu, which will have the project sites. So we had Ismia, Kerasinesis, uh, oh, two other sites, whose own domain is one of them, and then one other site. Those, so that version of it will have those four projects in it, uh, just sort of as an exemplar. Uh, but then you'll, anyone will be able to download and install this um, you know, on their own servers and use it all open source, all free. Uh, now, all of these digital archives, all these digital libraries, all these digital repositories, the backbone of that is, is Cora. Cora is our um, digital library um, and repository platform. It's about 10 or 12 years old now. Um, and we use it, again, free, open source, anyone can use it, anyone can install it. And we use it as the backbone for all of our digital library projects. And again, this very much sort of speaks to that free and open source software. This is all free, this is all open source, um, and it's sort of fully featured digital repository uh, platform. Uh, okay, um, I'm particularly interested in mobile heritage. Um, uh, and one of the projects that I'm working on right now that actually I sort of quietly launched in beta uh, is Embira. Um, Embira is a, um, an authoring platform for mobile heritage experiences. And it actually came out of a project called MSU Museum. MSU Museum is, was a, a mobile app um, and for those of you who were at my UCL talk where I said, don't do apps, apps are bad, yes, I made an app. 
Um, MSCZ was a, was a, a native I, uh, iPhone application that allowed people to explore the archaeology of the MSC campus. And we actually collaborated with the Campus Archaeology Program, the Campus Archaeology Program, which is directed by Lynn Goldstein. That is not Lynn Goldstein, that is Terry Brock, who is now a successful PhD who's working out in the world, um, is basically charged with protecting the archaeological heritage of the MSU campus. Mostly historic stuff, but also prehistoric stuff. So we actually work with campus archaeology, and they're certainly one of the really important stakeholders on campus that is engaged with uh, heritage and archaeology, but also very much engaged with digital heritage and, and digital archaeology. Um, all right, so Embera. Embera, so it's a platform, right? It's an ecosystem of tools. You have um, a digital repository that, and, that acts as sort of the backbone. You have the authoring plugin, and then you have these mobile templates, so that people um, actually uh, engage with what they actually see. Um, so you can have any number of projects. Um, each project, so that um, Embera is uh, built on the metaphor of space and place as museum. Thinking about space as a museum um, in an exhibit uh, kind of way. So what you do is you do projects, you build exhibits within those projects, and then you build locations within those um, exhibits. Um, and it's all sort of map-based, and you sort of plunk them down on a map. This is the authoring platform that you can see. Um, we're building it for Cora because that's what you know, that's our sort of main digital repository platform in the future. We're going to probably build this out for Omeka and WordPress and stuff like that. Um, so it's a full open source free authoring platform. You just install it on your servers um, and you are good to go. And then what you do is you connect up the template to the installation and it just starts pulling stuff out. So this is what it would look at from the user perspective, right? Exhibits. Uh, exhibit titles, locations, maps, that kind of that kind of stuff. Um, but we want to go beyond that. So building what I call explorations, they're just tours. I just hate the word tours, so I just use the word explorations. It sounds a little bit better, less mundane. Um, they are basically locations that are intended to be engaged with in a linear fashion, right? Where if I sort of go back here, you know, if you're looking at all, looking at this exhibit with all of these things, you don't have to engage with it in a in a linear uh, linear fashion. But this is intended to have a narrative that you explore linearly. Plus, we also want to engage the public in the heritage uh, or the archaeology, right? So have conversations, right? Any location has conversations around it, right? So this is a, um, a two-way dialogue. It's not just sort of providing or broadcasting the content or the heritage. It's actually engaging people in the heritage um, as, uh, as well. And beyond that, recognizing citizen experts, recognizing citizen scholars, giving citizens, whoever they may be, um, the, the respect that is due to them for the knowledge that they may have. Um, and the sort of easy, sort of frictionless way of doing this is actually having these badges that identifies users, types of users, projects, citizen scholars, so a citizen scholar can actually get a badge that denotes their level of expertise. So elevating their voice um, on par with uh, project personnel um, as well. Um, all right, so, so this, so we, I very quietly launched this in, uh, 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 in beta. Um, you can download it, you can install it, you can play with it, it is ready to roll. Um, with the caveat that there may be bugs. All right. Um, now, beyond the actually doing project work, right, doing digital heritage projects, Matrix, and much more broadly, all of these other units, including the Department of Anthropology, and then another lab that I'm going to talk to you about, are really invested in building capacity, training, giving uh, heritage professionals, archaeologists, scholars, um, the skills they need to engage with those uniquely digital questions. Again, we talked about this in CHI, uh, we were talking about CHI a little bit. And a big recent sort of 
instance of that desire is the Institute for Digital Archaeological Method and Practice, of which Dan was one of our instructors. So it's funded by the National Endowment of the Humanities. It was in collaboration with Anthropology and, and Matrix, which just basically means me, because that's me in both of those places. Um, so this is, so basically what we did is we brought together uh, uh, graduate students, museum archaeologists, uh, cultural resource management archaeologists, uh, academic archaeologists, around a two-year sort of curricular program where they would come to MSU um, and they would get instruction and all sorts of all sorts of stuff. Dan, you're not in this picture. I just realized. I come home. What? I come home already. He already has left. <laughs> Whatever. Um, and then essentially the outcome was to build a project, right? Um, and at the end of the of the second year, they uh, were supposed to um, a launch a a project. Now, sort of, we get sort of large group discussions, uh, sort of smaller group discussions, uh, collaboration. There's the and there's the picture I, I promised you. Uh, says Michelle Coons. Michelle is a curator of archaeology at the Denver Museum of Nature and uh, and Science. Um, so so it was very much collaborative. It was very uh, instructors helping people, people building stuff uh, together. With the outcome, the intended outcome being a tangible project. We had lots of really really great projects that were launched from this. Um, one, of the, one of the things that is very, very important to me um, is the fact that you should not talk about digital heritage and archaeology, you should build digital heritage and archaeology. You will learn far more, even if it's just futzing around and breaking things, you will learn far more from that act of actually building than you will sort of passively discussing uh, the field or the material. Much of what I do and much of what we've seen here is all uh, applied. Oh, here's Eric and, and Sarah. Um, and then fun weirdness as well. All right, now talking a little bit about, and this is where we're kind of wrapping up here, um, you know, the, again, that's sort of that thread that I've used to weave through this entire discussion um, is Matrix. But Matrix exists in this ecosystem of really um, uh, vibrant and interesting individuals and projects and centers and departments and, and all sort of stuff. And one of those is, is Leader. And I just sort of want to briefly introduce Leader. Leader is pedagogical. Leader is the lab for education, advancement, digital research. It's a collaboration between history and anthropology. Um, and its whole goal, um, and, the, and, and Dan will be very familiar with this, this is where we had the institute, um, it is a lab for infusing digital methods in undergraduate classes. So essentially what happens is undergraduate classes come in, they sign up, they collaborate with leader, they do little digital projects, they do big projects. It is a way of capacitating undergraduates who never ever would engage with this material and then again produce something tangible. This is actually a picture from my um, Archaeology of Ancient Egypt class where they're building a multi-year project called the Digital Atlas of Egyptian Archaeology. Um, and if anyone's interested, I'm, I'm happy to share the, the URL for that. And they learn how to do CSS and JavaScript and HTML and work with GitHub while essentially writing site reports. Right? So it's all within the context of the scholarship that they're sort of building these sort of digital stuff, uh, stuff as well. All right, so what's on the horizon for us? What are we doing? You know, we're doing lots of stuff, but what are some of the things that, that um, you know, we're moving, uh, we're moving into? Um, I am working with uh, Jody O'Gorman. Jody O'Gorman is my department chair, chair of anthropology, um, on building the digital archive of the Marquette Mission. Marquette Mission is the oldest Jesuit mission in the Midwest. It was founded in 1666. And it's in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, um, and it is in Marquette. That's what's called Marquette Mission. Um, and so we're building a, a digital archaeological repository uh, around that. Um, we're also working with Trimble. So if you're familiar, Trimble is a big um, sort of uh, laser scanning, geomatics, 
um, a global position, huge company in Boulder, Colorado. So we're working with them and the University of Colorado, or Colorado University, um, to 3D scan um, slave heritage sites. Um, this is somewhere on the U.S. Virgin Islands, I believe. Uh, both in Africa and in the Americas, and then build a specific public user experience around it. It isn't a preservation project per se, in the same way that a lot of 3D scanning projects are preservation projects, but it is preservation or digital uh, um, laser scanning and, and, and terrestrial LIDAR and photogrammetry uh, for the outcome being public um, engagement. This is past, so again, I can't show you a lot of these. This is the outcome, and this is the beyond the project team. You guys are the first to see this. Um, past is was an outgrowth of um, slave biographies, and it was a recognition of the fact that all right, slave biographies was one project, but there are lots of these other little silos of data or big silos of data that don't ever talk to one another. So um, people of the Atlantic slave trade, and it's all more mips because these are visual comps, um, is a linked open data platform to bring all of these together, all of these various um, uh, uh, projects together, um, and be able to search across them, to be able to engage with the uh, engage with the material, and also visualize it, you know, by data graphing or or maps. So this is a it's a Big projects. It's going to be a five-year project. We're going to start the first year uh, next year. And knock on Formica, this is going to be funded by the Mellon Foundation. Um, so this is, again, this is very much on the horizon. This is an, an outgrowth of um, slave biographies. Um, and then, of course, we're building the new version of Cora right now. Cora's been around for whatever 10, 12 years or so, and we are we are building the new version, which is going to be linked open data out of the box, real sort of modern web uh, uh, friendly, you know, much more accessible to sort of small and medium sized heritage institutions or projects that want to use it as a digital repository, digital library project. We're going to launch a beta of this if my if dev is to be believed. Uh, by the end of the summer. Okay, all right, so here is the punchline here. Right? I've, I've wandered through all of these, these projects. I want to sort of wrap it up and talk about sort of what fuels us, uh, our work at Matrix, uh, my work personally, as well as all the other digital heritage work. And this is, this is very kind of pie in the sky um, kind of philosophy uh, here, but it's particularly important. Um, the first, and this is a, so if you were at my UCL talk, you would have seen this slide. I put this slide up every talk I give, because I'm from Saskatchewan, and this is what Saskatchewan looks like, and it's filled with grain silos, but it's a really great metaphor, right? Disciplinary silos, pedagogical silos, intellectual silos, data silos, content silos are bad. They're counterproductive to this kind of uh, work. Plus, I really like grain silos. Um, also, this work requires a phenomenally important commitment to a culture of sharing, right? This stuff doesn't belong to us. And we have to engage in a strong culture of sharing, both with uh, um, uh, uh, collaborators overseas, collaborators in heritage institutions, but also other disciplines, right? The culture of sharing is really important. And finally, as you have already seen, I'm sure, and already uh, understand, we have a deep commitment to openness. Everything we do is, in one way or another, focused on openness. Open data, open collaboration, open web, open source software, both the production of and the consumption of open source software, open methods, open science, everything we do is uh, about a deep and sort of very, very important commitment to openness. So with that, I thank you very much.